Welcome everybody to Radicalized True Survives, episode 97, Georgia Defending Democracy. Today, High Fidelity and I are going to be interviewing Tamar Kinshorshvili. She is the editor-in-chief of the fact-checking online portal, Myth Detector. She also teaches media literacy programs to young people. She's going to explain why there are massive protests occurring right now in Georgia, what's behind it. And we're also going to show you how the work that she does is so important that she is being targeted with narrative warfare. Tamar, we are so grateful that you joined us today. Um, uh, we are incredibly inspired by what we're seeing happening in Georgia. And before we get into some of the uh, personal attacks that you have been enduring and exposing, can you just explain to our viewers, what is this uprising about? What is going on? Thank you for inviting me. Right now, Georgia's young people are protesting in the street against Russian style law, which was introduced by our government last year. But because of the protests of the people, they were forced to withdraw this legislation. After this development, Georgia gained candidacy status for EU integration. But unfortunately, uh, it looks like the EU integration means a lot of commitments uh, for democratic transformation. And it's not a useful time for government because we have state capture. This government is run by Russian oligarch Ivanishvili, and most ministers are appointed from his private bank, and they are accountable to Ivanishvili rather than to the public. That's why the problem, current problem in Georgia and with this government is that they see the democracy as a threat for themselves. And they are fighting with democratic institutions like civil society organizations, media outlets, all independent platforms that are not controlled by Ivanishvili. That's why ahead of final decision of EU, Georgian Dream announced special relationship with China because uh, they know public opinion is against Russia. And instead of direct shift of foreign policy, they uh, decided to prepare ground for soft shift and to start uh, reference to the Silk Road, traditional connections with China. That's why this is a U-turning moment for Georgia. Either we are preserving what we achieved so far, or we're going back to the authoritarian country where everything is run by Russian oligarch. 
I'm so grateful that you took the time to explain that. I want to say, America, are you listening? Are you listening to what's happening? Are you paying attention? Because in Georgia, they know exactly what this stuff is. We have been observing the authoritarian capture here. We did something in 2020, which was remarkable. We voted out a dictator who was in the process of capturing all of our institutions. And they are trying to do it again in November. And I think it's very important that this country is showing the rest of the world that you can rise up and you can stand up to this stuff. And um, I want to have you explain um, the video uh, that we opened with, which shows the um, flyers that were being put up by operatives in order to try to denigrate the work and the work of your team. Can you explain what that's about? Um, uh, actually, over last week, not only me, but other watchdog organization, investigative reporters were targeted during night near our offices or in certain cases in front of the homes of the watchdog organization, members of this organization, appear strange posters saying that we are traitors, we are foreign spies, and we are executors of foreign interests here, and there is no place for foreign spies in Georgia. Uh, so we uh, detected through the security camera video that people dressed in black wearing masks were putting these posters uh, in midnight, it was 2 a.m. in our office to fight. <laughs> the, their goal is our transparency while they're doing this everything in hidden way during the night in order to demonize the NGOs and present them as a fighters for foreign interests, which is not true. The most uh, activities related to democracy are mostly supported by Western donors. And we are using this support to make our country better, to achieve the democratic transformation and consolidation of democracy. The 2012 was significant in terms of consolidating democracy because it was first peaceful transfer of power through election. For consolidation of democracy, we need second such election and we have elections in October. NGOs are obstacles and transparency, accountability is a problem for current government and they are trying to distract attention from main problems to artificially created problems even related to security perception in our society. After Russia's invasion in Ukraine, our government started to accuse our Western partners in dragging Georgia into the war and opening second front. And they are using this weaponization of war fears, which is natural fear in any society, to terrorize society and to demonstrate that they are only government who ensure peace and US, uh, EU, Western countries or Ukraine, they are aiming to open second front in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, we have the Russia's military presence on our ground and uh, this serves only Russia's interest to shift focus from current security challenges, which is obviously Russia's military presence on the ground, to the challenges that uh, is created by government itself, because US is Georgia's strategic partner, helping to build our army, helping to develop our institutions, promote educational programs, support financially different programs in order to educate young people who will serve Georgia, not US, but they are coming back in order to be engaged in the building of our country. So, and this, at the same time, they are not mentioning Russia as a security threat for our country. 
and it undermines perception of threats in our society. And besides uh, this weaponization of war fears, uh, they are also referring to this so-called Surkov's concept of sovereign democracy, which was invented by Russia, saying that if you are questioning democracy in Russia, you are interfering in domestic affairs. Our government opted this concept, uh, and they are saying that any criticism related to our internal democratic issues, related to justice reform, etc. It's similar to Moscow, who was dictating how we should behave, which is nonsense itself, because Soviet Union was authoritarian country. Now we are speaking about international law, about justice. Georgians want to integrate into Europe because we aim to improve our judicial system and we share same values with European countries. Otherwise, we are not intending to have only visa-free travel, which is, of course, very important for our country and society. And the third uh, modus operandi of current government is to use identity-related discourse uh, against the West, which is part of the Ruski Mir concept, so-called Russian world concept, uh, which presents Moscow as a third Rome uh, that uh, tries to defend our religious, ethnic identity from pervert West. So, and wow. this is quite emotional and Orthodox Church plays its role, and we see the special relationship with Hungary and similar pattern. Unfortunately, besides the Dugin, uh, government-affiliated actors are trying to amplify Tucker Carlson's messages, uh, similar messages on re identity-related topics which makes detection of the problem in our society more difficult because they are speculating on division in Western societies. And they are saying that we aim to integrate into traditional West, traditional Europe rather than pervert one. So I've got a bunch of questions. I know Hi-Fi has some questions, but just to <laughs> cement it in the minds of our viewers, uh, there's a hashtag uh, no to Russian law. And can you just uh, succinctly explain what exactly they're trying to pull on uh, the Georgian people and why they're out there in the streets so aware that this law is not um, what they say it is? Uh, because government already declared that they want to punish us, these paintings and posters on the walls of the main watchdog organization, best demonstration what they want to achieve. This is Russian style action. And it happens before enforcement, before official adaptation of this legislation. And these posters speak better uh, than me of what their intention is. Brilliant. Any legislation has the aim the aim of Western legislation to protect country from foreign interference. Yes. When we're talking about Western aid, it's transparent. It's for support of democracy, human rights, for capacity building of state institutions, everything available on our website. We are not hiding anything because of course. our donors make this grant conditional, we have uh, obligation to inform public how we are spending this funding. All information available to tax expansions, we are reporting quarterly. Of course. Most media outlets are reporting this income. It's not about transparency. No. It's tool to punish us. That's exactly it. 
It says it says the bill requires organizations receiving more than 20% of their funding from abroad to register as agents of foreign influence or face punitive fines. That is absolutely to punish the West and to try to uh, try to hobble the work that you do, which is very, very important work. That's where I want to go next. But Hi-Fi, you jump in. When I think about Georgia and I think about Russian disinformation, I can't help but go back to 2008 when Russia invaded Ossetia and Abkhazia and how they lied to the world about how they said, it's Georgia starting this war, it's Georgia. It's Ge and, and for some reason people bought it. And then we saw the same thing in Crimea and they bought it. And now we see this individual, Ivanishvili, and he seems to be a product of Russia. He is a billionaire from Russia. The tactics that are being used against the forces that would stand against the Georgian Dream Party uh, are reminiscent of the Zersetsung, of the Stasi in East Germany. They're putting up flyers. They're trying to intimidate you. They're going to your homes. Um, why do you think the wider Western world doesn't understand that Russia is attempting this, not just in Georgia, right? But it's also in America. We're seeing it in Ireland. Uh, we see it in the far right in Germany. Uh, we see it in Italy. We see it in, in France, in Le Pen, in the far right. That Why do you think the world does not understand this? Uh, because of modus operandi of these actors, initially when Ivanishvili came to power, actually it was a step forward in terms of democracy, because first peaceful transfer of power happened in Georgia. And all Western organization partners welcomed this step. But unfortunately, he played like in Potemkin's village, saying, delivering one messages uh, to the West, and internally they have the totally different communication um, messages. And some Western partners believe that he is truly dedicated to integrate into the West, and we local watchdog organizations are exaggerating. But after 2020, maybe earlier, they started to accuse investor partners. Uh, and they clean, even if really managed to clean political space from his political opponents, opposition is divided. Only obstacle on this way and only free money from Ivanishvili is Western funding allowing independent actors to operate in this country and to do their work. Uh, that's why he decided he's more uh, powerful now because his perception is that West needs Georgia more rather than Georgia needs West, which is wrong per se. Georgia needs West to survive from Russia. If uh, authoritarian uh, governance is a security challenge for this country. Ivanishvili tries to preserve power at any cost, but authoritarian style of governance is more acceptable for him rather than democracy. Democracy is a threat for Ivanishvili, not Russia. And our Western partner should understand this. I think it's too late because he's refusing to meet the um, people from Western organization from US, um, now he's prepared even for sanctions and sanctions are late, I assume. So as a follow-up to that, I want to ask, uh, one of the things I see a lot of uh, in these countries where Russia is engaging in these operations, uh, I see the political operatives, but I also see a lot of organized crime and money laundering and are there ties to any of that type of organized crime inside of Ivanishvili's uh, political parties inside of his government are you seeing corruption on the rise in Georgia uh, actually there are some rumors but not 
investigation so far proving that, but some in journalistic investigation showed that, that his ministers are getting the money uh, from his bank as loans and they are getting some properties, etc. But yeah. there is no complex investigation per se. There are signs of corruption and they're using these street gangs to uh, actually physically assault opposition leaders, activists. During last days when we were receiving these phone calls, some of them were beaten physically ahead of big rally in order to intimidate and threaten these people. So yes. they're using usually these street criminals um they're controlling them they are wearing this black um clothes they are masked and there is no investigation so far which is difficult to follow up uh, actually thank you when titushki is yes. what they're doing they, this they yeah. are titushki exactly so um, thank you for that, both of you. Um, what I am hearing and what you're describing are echoes of what happened a decade ago in Ukraine uh, with uh, Maidan. And, it, and I don't know if that's a fair comparison, but here's a country that wants to move toward the West. Here's a country that thought its leader would move them toward the West and become a part of EU. Here is all of a sudden this retraction and the people have been deceived and now there are people in the streets. And are there parallels that you can see uh, between what happened in Ukraine to what's happening in Georgia? Actually, it's public protest, but even comparison with Maidan in Georgia might cause uh, some attacks from the side of government. They can okay. accuse us, okay. me and you, in conspiracy against our country. For instance, uh, I saw today the US, probably US citizen was arrested during the protests and they accused him of being the staging revolution. But I saw also information that he's just English teacher in one of the school. And uh, under this government, everything is possible. Okay. Of course, this protest is similar for the EU integration, but they are using any statement uh, for compromising the people and the world Maidan is compromised by them, which is not the bad thing which happened with Ukraine because Ukrainian people um, succeeded and uh, uh, integrated into European family. Of course, uh, for final integration, there are a lot of steps to be taken, but Ukraine is ahead and Ukraine fights our fight while our government attacks Ukraine in addition to our other strategic partners. Presenting Ukraine as enemy of this country is another alarming trend we are observing in mainstream media controlled by government. Thank you so much for explaining that. That was so important. Um, I have a belief that part of what Putin's regime's, uh, you know, narrative warfare is if they can, they cannot have countries near them showing that democracy works. It, and here in America, there are always reports and indictments uh, explaining that Russia is meddling in our own internal elections, internal affairs, because if it's proven that democracy works in their, in their own country, the Russians will maybe someday wake up and realize that they haven't had a free and fair election uh, since Putin came to power. And um, so I think that neighboring countries showing that democracy can work is very, very lethal to him, which brings me to the work that you do, which is incredibly important because in America, we have no inoculation against information warfare. We have little podcasts like ours, we have people who write books and try to, you know, uh, bring up the question, but we've been a target nation of information warfare for a decade, at least at this high level. 
and 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 no protection against it. And the work that you do specifically is to try to inform uh, people about the live factory coming out of Russia, uh, all of the uh, active measures. And can you um, kind of help us out? Explain what you do and then help us out. We need help. <laughs> I think you have many good organization in US, Bellingcat, fact checkers, who are also doing important work and we are strong together. We're a member of the different international networks and these connections, sharing experience is very helpful and even support when you tweet something and uh, you are encouraged by many people internationally, it gives you feeling that you are not left alone with your government, which tries to suppress your free voices. Um, can you tell us about Myth Detector? Uh, Myth Detector is a fact-checking platform. Initially, we were operating only Georgia, but after Russia's invasion in Ukraine, we started, we added Russian addition to Myth Detector. We have partnership with Meta. We are flagging false content on Meta's platform, not only in Georgia, but in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And we observe similar pattern in these countries and uh, having bigger data helps you better understand what is going on and where information comes from. Sometimes uh, hostile actors are using well-known Western media outlets, their brands to mislead public. People are thinking that they are sharing CNN or Guardian from UK, but actually they are sharing imposter content because Russia today, Sputnik, they are lacking legitimacy. That's why it's difficult sometimes to detect the Russian footprint when they are using even Tucker Carlson's videos. So they have the YouTube channel, Tucker Carlson in Russian, because it's more convincing when you have English speaker um, to deliver with the same messages rather than to listen to Russia Today or Sputnik. Uh, so this is deflection. This deflective wow. source model works quite um, well. And that's why we try through media literacy to educate young people how to identify harmful content, how to track transparency of sources. In certain cases, fake CNN or fake BBC, they are registered in uh, Saint Petersburg, and it's nobody, everybody knows that no one go uh, to Russia to, to register IP address there. Uh, so uh, Russia uses uh, Western achievements better than their homes. They are using democracy to undermine democracy and democratic platforms. And they learn how to avoid platform policies because West is more transparent and you should go through procedures, uh, they learn better, they know better how to avoid this transparent policy developed through inclusive process. One of the questions I have is, sure, anyone can create uh, disinformation, false information, intentionally misleading information. One of the things I think that makes these networks so effective at spreading this intentionally misleading information is their utilization of troll farms. And from what I've seen, there are state-sponsored troll farms, like the Internet Research Agency, but then there are also private independent troll farms that operate inside of a country like in the united states we have troll farms in this country that the gop was using but they are spreading foreign 
misleading information? Do you know if there's any sort of discussion to quantify that type of activity as uh, enemy cognitive warfare combat actions, or is that still a legal gray area? Uh, it just seems like the delivery mechanism for this weapon, the information, uh, exists not only at a state-sponsored level, just coming from Russia, other authoritarian governments, but also private companies. And that seems like a problem to me. So uh, any ideas? Yeah, I agree with you that coordinated dissemination of this content is the main problem. Uh, Meta has specific policy, developed specific policy on coordinated inauthentic behavior. But what I mean that hostile actors learn how to avoid policy. They divide their task and they act in different ways. And it's more time consuming because we have so many languages, so many authoritarian countries. In Georgian case, we have not only Russian-run trolls factory, but our own government operated a trolls factory. And we revealed number of cases. Most of them, I assume, are working for public servants service we are taxpayers paying them money uh, to serve as the public servants but they are abusing the administrative resources in order to serve Ivanishvili and we revealed number of cases and later meta proof that these accounts we are linked to prime minister strategic communication units these trolls were used to demonize opposition NGOs and attack Ukrainian government. And these people we are using the pictures of the strangers and giving interviews with these visuals to the mainstream opposition media outlets. That's why uh, when it's uh, actually part of the government apparatus, it's difficult to detect and we have two fronts. Uh, external coming from Russia and domestic with our own government. Unfortunately, some Western donors were supporting our government to fight Russian disinformation while our government was using these resources to fight against uh -huh. local NGOs and media. And this is also part of the problem. Uh, I just, it's just, it makes your head spin, right? I. Uh, did an investigation looking into the Philippine troll farms. They have quote unquote marketing groups where you can hire, uh, you know, actors to disparage whoever you want. And at the time, Duterte, who won paying a couple hundred thousand to have his own troll army, didn't hide any of it, wasn't really illegal in the Philippines. So, so he admitted to spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay people to promote him and to uh, disparage and discredit um, his uh, opponent. And, you know, Hi-Fi has said, you know, there's, there's a solution. The solution is if you're paid to do that type of character assassination, just like advertisement, there needs to be something that shows that you're paid. And we have not seen that type of action here. My final question to you, unless there's anything else we missed, is that, you know, I've been an investigative reporter for a very long time. Your background is clearly in reporting. And I feel like, A, it's a dangerous job right now. And B, it's one of the most important jobs of our time. And that is, I think, continually why, particularly independent investigative reporters, those doing the work that you're doing, like in the nonprofit space, uh, the work is incredibly vital. The attacks are escalating accordingly. Um, so first, I want to thank you and your team for all the bravery of, of what you're doing and even giving us this interview. But um, is there anything that we can do to support your work or anything you want to say about the importance of this type of investigative reporting in this moment in time? I think most important is to continue 
doing what we were doing so far because government wants us to be silent we are not planning to register as foreign agent because it undermines trust in our activities we are trying with us uh, our partners to find solutions we are ready to be sanctioned fi financially uh, even it will make our operation here in Georgia impossible. We will try to uh, operate somewhere else, maybe outside of Georgia. Uh, I was joking with um, other journalists today because we were asked to conduct trainings for Belarusian journalists to share our experience. Now it's time for us to learn from Belarusian journalists how to operate within authoritarian, with authoritarian regimes. So uh, there is always room for operation. First of all, we are ready to defend our um, achievements in democracy, what we had so far in the streets. And later, we will find solutions for operation. We are not planning to quit our job. It's very important. Your support is very important and encouragement. And uh, I think social media has many uh, negative aspects, but it connects us, like-minded people, freedom fighters, and freedom fighters always can achieve uh, best, best solution for their countries. and. Thank you for your support. Oh my gosh, I, I'm just so grateful and so moved. And this is all just so very real. America, if you're listening, pay attention to what she's saying. Pay attention to what's happening in Georgia. High five, final word. The final word I have is, it feels like the authoritarians are pretending to be bigger and more powerful than they actually are. Yes, they have captured government institutions. Yes, they have these troll armies online pretending to be hundreds, if not thousands of different people. But when I see the videos of people on the streets of Georgia protesting against this authoritarianism, it feels like the power resides with the people. Agree? Disagree? Agree. People can change this country for the better. And uh, attempts to silence us shows their weaknesses rather than strengths, as you mentioned. Even they are, um, they have more resources rather than we Georgian people. Yeah, I I think people always underestimate their own power. And uh, our fear in America is that they're going to obey in advance. And you have just inspired um, our viewers who are actually global to stay in action and remain in action. Tamar, thank you so much for thank being you. with us here today. People can find more about their work at mythdetector.ge uh, and support these vital these vital organizations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.